So welcome to One Schoolhouse, What's New This Week. And I'm Sarah Hannawald, the uh, director, the assistant head of school for professional development at One Schoolhouse. And I'm delighted to have you here. And I'm welcoming today, Andy Shaw. Andy is the director of professional learning at the Folio Collaborative, which is an organization many of you know. Folio is a nonprofit leadership collective devoted to helping schools make professional development a strategic priority. And Andy, thank you so much. Can you just say hello and tell everyone a little bit about you? And I don't want to ignore that I'm joined here by Peter Gao. This is sometimes called the Peter and Sarah show with One Schoolhouse. So thank you, Peter. Well, thanks, Sarah. Uh, thanks, Peter. It's, uh, I, I didn't know there was a Peter and Sarah show, but if I had known, it would have been a lifelong aspiration for me to be on it. Um, <laughs> So very briefly about myself, um, I'm the Director of Professional Learning at Folio, um, which hopefully many of you have, have heard of before. Um, uh, my background is originally as an independent school math teacher um, and then academic dean, dean of curriculum and innovation. Um, I've worked in, in the boarding school world and the day school world on both coasts. Um, and then most recently, um, prior to Folio, I worked for a nationwide consulting firm that worked with public school districts around things like leadership development, strategic planning, strategic design, instructional change, things like that. Um, at Folio, I have the really cool job of getting to help our 150 or so member schools um, think about all the ways that they support professional growth in their schools, um, which I think connects beautifully to what we're here to talk about today. Great, thank you. And Andy, I'm really grateful you could join us because this year, I am just hearing all kinds of things about how academic leaders are planning to discuss faculty growth goals, goals, give feedback. There's a lot of uncertainty on the part of academic leaders and a lot of confusion about what the right thing is to do, because that's what academic leaders want to do. They want to do right by the teachers, and they're not sure about what that is. What have you been hearing? Yeah, we're hearing the same thing. Um... I, you know, I, we, we, I spend a lot of my time on the phone um, and on Zoom with leaders, and I think we're hearing, one thing we're hearing is just about timing. Um, timing for everything looks different in schools, and timing um, around growth and, and feedback conversations is no exception. So, so that, that's one element. We're seeing a lot of goal setting being pushed later, observation being pushed later, things like that. Um, but I would say the bigger... Um, kind of theme we're hearing from leaders has to do with kind of where I stand on um, on w what growth will look like this year, right? We've, we've got some leaders who are in the boat of all growth and goal setting is on hold. Um, and then we've got kind of leaders at the other end of the spectrum who are saying, you know, full steam ahead, <laughs> ignore the pandemic. Uh, our, our strategic priorities are still in effect. Um, and then we've got folks in the middle who are saying growth is still important, but it's going to have to look different this year. Um, I, I tend to, to like that middle path. There's not, not a right answer for, for all schools, but I think the, um, the idea of growth needing to be central and needing to look different feels like the right course of action. I think that kind of the Goldilocks. first of all, say meet, that again? Kind of the Goldilocks meet in the middle. Yeah. Well, Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it, it, in part that's because um, we know growth is happening, right? Look, teachers are doing everything in their lives differently right now. So that is growth. Um, but I, uh, you know, they're, they're teaching in virtual environments. They're trying to maintain their, own, maintain their own sustainability in different ways. They're using new technologies. They're attending differently to student SEL. Um, and they're thinking differently about equity and inclusion in response to, to the civil uprisings this year. Um, and I think, I think what I am trying to talk to school leaders about is the idea that if growth is going to happen no matter what, we as educators know that it's the scaffolds and the structures and the schema that we help people put around their learning that ultimately impacts what they're going to take away from the experience, right? If I'm in the whitewater just flailing around all day, I'll learn something, but probably not in a terribly efficient way. But if we've clearly defined priorities, um, goal setting processes, targeted support, coaching, um, it's a lot easier to kind of screen out the noise and build a structure that will contain and support learning moving forward. Um, and so the question is, how do you do that in a way that feels supportive to your teachers? So 
let's dive into this a little bit. So what types of goals do you recommend that leaders help teachers set this year? Um, you know, the, the first instinct is to go with survive, right? So we're gonna get through the year. But how can we look beyond that in a way that is more positive, but absolutely psychological safety has to be a priority. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's the million dollar question, right? Um, I was on the phone last night um, with, a, with a group of teachers, one of whom put it really beautifully. She said, the goal is to survive this year, but thinking intelligently about how I'm gonna survive is what my growth will look like. And I think, I think that's, a, you know, she said it better than I ever could. I mean, that was exactly it, right? We have to get to a place where teachers feel like growth and goal setting is not an add-on, um, but it's directly connected to um, whatever my hardest thing is right now. And I, to me, that's what a good goal is, right? What's keeping you up at night? What's stressing you out? What's causing you to pull out your hair? That challenge ought to be the root of your goal, right? Um, and naming it as a goal isn't an add-on. It's a way to put a nice box around your biggest challenge so you can work to tackle it in a more strategic way. Um, so things like... Um, the, the things that we hear most often from teachers this year have to do with remote virtual environments, sustainability, technology use, DEI, student SEL, things like that. And so the question is, for us anyway at Folio, we think of goals as how might we question. So take that challenge um, and find the how might we um, that sits below it. And that's, that's your goal. And all you're committing to, you're not committing to like hitting certain metrics. You're just committing to trying to answer that how might we question over the course of the year, which honestly for some teachers might be, how might I get more sleep at night in order to be more even tempered with my students during the day, right? Or how might I bring the same warmth to my virtual classroom in order to build strong relationships with my students? I think those are both very valid goals this year. Um, and the more we can honor that kind of authentic goal setting by teachers, the less it will feel, I think, like an add-on or, or, or the, the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah, and I think, too, that invites that what's next conversation, too. If we're looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, say, for an example, the relationship setting as a goal, what can we carry on that we learn about setting effective relationships into because there will be a post-COVID school year. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, when yeah. we get to that. So, for example, ASCD just published an article calling on school leaders to really examine homework policies. One of the things that we do at One Schoolhouse is we don't really differentiate, oh, this is classwork, this is homework. When we're teaching online, it's all learning work, right? And so we might have some things that are formative assessment, we might have some activities that are practice, but we don't break it up in some of the old definitions of what that is. So we're not all ready to say, okay, we're not gonna call it homework anymore, but how do academic leaders figure out how to balance the difference among teachers in terms of what's a reasonable goal? So teacher appetite for PD varies tremendously all the time. And this year I'm seeing some posts in some of the different communities, like I have been developed, that's quite enough, thank you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I mean, that's a really interesting tension to think about. I mean, it, it, it kind of lives for me in two different boxes uh, as I listen to you talk. I mean, the first is around um, kind of institutional priorities and goal setting. I, I think it is, it is one of the most nuanced dances of an administrator, even in, a, in normal times, um, to figure out what are my strategic priorities for the school this year? Um, and how much change can I ask teachers to take on in this moment, right? And, and that, that was five years ago, that was a challenge. It's, it's doubly or triply a challenge now. Um, but I think partly it comes down to knowing, knowing your teachers and your staff um, as you think about what the strategic priorities are and are we really going to reinvent homework or grading this year or not? And, and that's probably different for every school. I think that for us then the question is, okay, based on whatever the administrator has identified as strategic priorities, which might be DEI and teacher wellness, right? Maybe those are our only priorities this year. Um, I, I'm thinking of some schools that I've spoken to recently. But then I think it's really about giving as much uh, flexibility and teacher directedness as possible when it comes to goal setting. Goal setting. I think we see, you know, we all know those teachers who are somehow able to reinvent everything all at once and still wake up in the morning looking energized. Um, 
And then you've got folks who are really, because of their, um, where they are emotionally or their family circumstances or their health, um, who are really all they can do right now is focus on their own, their own teaching. Um, and I think we need to honor that. Uh, it doesn't mean they don't need to set goals, um, but I think, I think the, the, the way their goals look needs to be tailored to each individual and where they are. Um, I, I think two caveats for me though, you know, if we're gonna focus on emphasizing teacher directedness and flexibility, the first is everybody's gotta grow, right? Your growth might be just find a way that to get through the day a little more calmly, a little more um, in, a, in a more organized fashion, whatever it is that's, that's your biggest challenge right now, but you have to grow. Nobody, nobody gets to say this year, I'm not, I'm not gonna grow, I'm not gonna set a goal. I don't think that's healthy, I don't think that's supportive. Um, and the other thing is I, I do think that um, it's actually a service to teachers right now for schools to set priorities, right? Because um, if we don't identify what's important, then teachers feel like everything's important and I need to be trying to do everything at once, right? So by setting priorities, whatever those are, right? It might be reinventing homework, it might just be healthier teachers, it might be DEI, it might be um, stronger online community, whatever. But by setting those pri priorities and asking teachers to direct their goal setting in those directions, I think we do teachers a service by helping them understand what maybe we can let go of a little bit this year. Great, thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions starting to come in. I just wanna remind everybody, we're gonna use the Q&A for questions and then the chat for resource sharing and um, comments to one another. So please feel free to jump into the chat to connect with other attendees and the Q&A to ask Andy a question. So, Andy, you said that everybody's going to grow this year, and that's not an option. And I think that's probably um, growth is not optional. It's, it's pretty well accepted by everyone. But so in times of high stress, though, what kind of feedback do you find is most helpful to teachers? And I'm going to put in the chat an article that I just read about platitudes not necessarily being particularly helpful feedback. So I'm going to mute myself while you answer that and put that in the chat. And remember, everybody use Q&A for questions. Uh, and so, well, I think, Sarah, my perspective on feedback has really evolved over the last couple of years. Um, I, I, one of the most kind of uh, formative pieces I've read is, um, is a piece called The Feedback Fallacy. Um, it was published in HBR a year or two ago. Um, and the argument that that piece makes, based on, on research, um, is that the, there's a big difference in terms of the kinds of benefits we can get out of positive feedback versus critical feedback. Um, and, and to me, that kind of thinking is really important right now. Um, in, in a time, I mean, let's talk about neuroscience for a second, right? Teachers, many of us, I think especially teachers, are um, in full on red mode right now in terms of their emotional well being. They're stressed, they're out of their comfort zone, they're feeling threatened. Um, and it's, it's really hard to integrate feedback in an effective way when you're in that mode. Um, and so um, I, I think that's a backdrop we need to kind of keep in mind throughout all of this. Um, the idea behind the feedback fallacy is that if you're trying to bring somebody up from below competent to competent, that's where critical feedback is really crucial. Um, you, you know, a, a teacher who otherwise you might have to release from their contract, um, let's really focus on effectively delivering critical feedback. Um, but the, the piece makes the case that um, if we're trying to bring people to excellent, probably the most effective thing you can do is to figure out what they're doing that is excellent and tell them exactly why what they're doing is excellent. Um, so find the bright spots, celebrate and dissect those for somebody. Um, the, the, the benefits and the payoffs from that approach um, are much more significant than, than critical feedback to what's not working um, to, to, to get from mediocre to excellent. Um, it, I, and I think especially in this, this, this moment with the teachers who are in the red zone, I, I think I would tend towards that approach. Um, I think we really need to ask ourselves sometimes as leaders, um, is that thing that jumps out to us, is it problematic or is it something um, that, that might bug us but isn't that big a deal in the, in the grand scheme of things? 
You know, I really like the way that you put that. And I'm thinking about, in particular, teachers who, um, last week we had Lori Pauka with us and she talked about, you know, the, the bar is here internally sometimes for people. And if they get the messaging, you know, school teachers don't accept the, it's okay to do less than your best because that's not who they are and that's not how they're internally motivated. Like, oh, it's okay. To, to not do my version of my best. And she talked about helping people see that as a shift rather than a lowering of the bar. This year, I am not doing some of the things that I used to do because I am now doing some things mm -hmm. that I didn't have to do before and how helpful that is in framing that conversation. And when you mentioned the need to look at what teachers are doing well, I'm thinking about that independent school teacher with the bar that's here realizing that there are things they're not going to get to do and maybe not realizing what it is that they're doing incredibly well. Maybe they have structured their online space in such a way that students have more choice than ever before and that's resonating with students, you know, and they're seeing it as a coping mechanism and you as an academic leader can point that out as a real highlight. I, yeah, I totally agree. And I think that's also where goal setting comes into play, you know, that, that, uh, the majority of the time, again, unless we're unless we're worried about somebody who's not performing at even a minimal level, um, there are hundreds and hundreds of, of facets of a teacher's job description. Um, a really effective thing to do is to give feedback targeted to the parts of that job description they are actively trying to improve on, the ones they've prioritized, right? Um, and um, and so I think I think knowing somebody's goals and being able to direct your feedback towards those goals. Um, gives them permission not to be perfect in all of those other hundred areas. That's a good point. You mentioned earlier that the timeline has shifted. I think one of the things that academic leaders are struggling with this year is that timelines are shifting regularly. I talked with a division head who said, well, we're on our fourth schedule and I'm about to send out, she said, I think it's 4.5. We're not completely changing the schedule again, but we're adapting it. And so how do we handle disrupted timelines when we still want to be having, you know, these one-on-one -on -one conversations, the goal setting conversations, what's a way for academic leaders to manage the disruption? Yeah, a couple of thoughts. I mean, first of all, everything's happening later, you know, and, and at first we were, we were really wondering, you know, what are, what, what's going on here? And, and now we're seeing actually a real tide of, of goals being set. Um, by teachers all around the country and, and goals conversations happening. It's just that they're later, right? There was so much emphasis going into opening up schools. Um, the, I mean, I, I think the other piece that comes up for me when I think about timeline is um, everybody's bandwidth, right? So we still need to grow. Uh, we still need to set goals. We still need to talk about it, but are there ways to do it asynchronously? Probably, yes, I think so. Um, are there ways to, um, you know, you and I haven't talked much today about administrators, but administrators are pretty underwater too. Um, and so I'm talking with a lot of schools who have historically had goals conversations happen, um, administrator to, to teacher that are now exploring what would it be like if this were more of a teacher to teacher workflow. Um, and that's not going to work everywhere, but I think it is, personally, I like that approach in general, and I think it may be even more salient right now. Um, and then, you know, I think, as is always the case in schools, I think, let's figure out how to do, uh, doing a little bit, doing a slice is sometimes better than doing nothing. And I think with growth, that's true. Like, better to say, um, we'll have shorter conversations, or we'll have fewer conversations than to say, we're not going to talk at all about growth. So we've gotten a question now, I'll remind everybody to use the Q&A for the question, but this one came to me directly. Uh, you mentioned DEIB, and someone would like to know how do equity and inclusion factor into observation and feedback, and why that's important right now. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, I've had, I would say, the the most um, rich conversations I've had this year have been with a number of folks around around this topic. Right, the, uh, we're we're focused on COVID, and and that's for good reason. And um, there are some really important things happening, awakenings happening in our country around equity and belonging and inclusion, justice. 
Um, and so it's been really good um, for me to, to kind of dig a little bit into what does that mean for, for observation and feedback? I think the some of the big kind of takeaways that, that we're working with at Folio right now have to do with, first of all, the the way inequity um, is, is unfortunately, unfortunately baked into observation and feedback and evaluation systems in many of our schools. Um, and I, I think one of the, the biggest ways that that's true is um, the ways in which folks from marginalized groups of marginalized identities um, can often perceive very differently the experience of being observed, um, being evaluated, receiving feedback, um, very, very differently than, than those who, who um, have more kind of privileged identities. Um, and that, that really well-intentioned systems um, that don't take into account um, the, the, the emotional impact um, for marginalized folks um, can, can really be pretty traumatic. Um, so, you know, some of the things that we're talking to schools about have to do with um, thinking about how you are, um, first of all, naming your own biases as an observer when you go into a classroom. What, what kind of process are you doing before you go into the classroom to identify your own biases about what good teaching looks like, for example. Um, as a school, what we are doing to make tremendously transparent our assumptions about what good teaching is. Um, first of all, to have inclusive discussions about that, but then once we've agreed on it, to put it down in writing so that everybody has equal access to the definition of what's a good teacher. Um, really looking at how do we help administrators get to know um, their teachers as whole people um, because of the way my experience, if I were somebody from a marginalized identity, the way my experience as a whole person or not living in the school community can impact my feeling of belonging and my, my ability to emotionally um, integrate the feedback I, I receive from someone, especially if they're a supervisor with a power dynamic, especially if their identity is different than mine. Um, we have to make sure that, that trust and, um, and the whole person are the foundation of evaluation and observation and feedback efforts. That sounds great. Peter, I think you had a question. Sure. Uh, I've, got, <laughs> I've got a bunch, but I'll try to focus on one. And, and this may not be exactly a folio question, but I'm sort of thinking now about uh, the people who are sort of the, the middle managers in schools, the academic administrators, the uh, and in terms of you know, we, we, we sort of talk about observation and, uh, about, you know, all of this as being sort of a, a, a hierarchical thing. But you, you mentioned, you know, teachers using, you know, giving teachers the opportunity to support one another in this process and observe one another. How do administrators at that sort of, you know, down from the, the senior table, um, how do they support one another? And is there a purpose in, in doing some goal setting there. I, I will say that as an academic administrator, um, I was never exactly observed or even evaluated formally uh, in a number of years. And I could have been better if I'd had some, some good feedback along the way, I suspect. But is there, is there a place, and maybe this year especially, for that kind of peer interaction that may not be a formal observation process, but does involve the sharing of goals and maybe looking in and, and on what our fellows are doing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does, Peter. And I would say it is absolutely a follow-up question. We, um, with all the schools we work with, we try to encourage them to think about goal setting processes, not just with teachers, but with administrators, with support staff. Um, there isn't a very good reason in my mind where why everyone who works in the school shouldn't be setting a goal or two or three every year, right? We're all trying to grow. Um, so yes, I think so, absolutely. And I think um, as someone who shares your experience of kind of loneliness and, and a lack of kind of organized growth support as an administrator, I, I totally agree with the idea that um, there's a lot of benefit there and especially a lot of benefit to potentially having peers who are in that middle administrative layer um, support each other in growth, right? In exploring goal setting, um, in checking in with each other, accountability partnership, that kind of thing. Um, 
so yeah, I, I, I would think so. And I think, um, I think there's, there would be a lot of benefits in launching a light version of that this year. I think trust and belonging come from uh, that kind of that kind of relationship, that kind of work. And so when you have people who are exhausted and worn out and scared and overwhelmed, um, building partnerships where we can talk to each other about the ways we're growing, um, I think would do wonders for the well-being of, of the middle managers this year. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we've got um, one question and then we had an article shared in the chat, but it just went to the panelists. So I'm going to reshare that to everybody. It's a great article that Peter and I use in a cohort that we lead. So yeah. that's what I need. I, but, I uh, Andy, this is a doozy. Um, uh -oh. New teachers. <laughs> How do we support new teachers with growth and goals? Obviously, they're growing. I'm going to add that. They're, they're growing. Tremendously, but I think the questioner is talking about people who are not just new to our school, but new to the profession entirely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a webinar right there. <laughs> that, that is a webinar. I'm, I'm just kind of thinking about that for a second. I was on the phone recently with um, a leader from a from a school um, that has gone the route of, of diminishing section size by by hiring a lot of teachers, and in this case, it was teachers who had um, in a lower school who been um, kind of teaching assistants or seconds in the classroom prior. And so these are folks who had never really had to be responsible for their own classroom who are all of a sudden promoted into this space. Um, and I think it's a challenge for leaders who are already stretched thin to give folks the support they need. Um, and it's, it's a, a tenuous thing of, yes, I've promoted you to being in charge of a full classroom and you still need a lot of help. And how do we, how do we negotiate that balance? Um, in some ways, I don't know if my answer is much different than for other teachers. I think, I think setting goals and having conversations as much as possible is really important. Um, and I also think that, that um, the same thing that is true for a, for a leader always is even mo more true in this context, which is um, nobody's gonna get perfect at everything all of a sudden, right? So let's, let's figure out together, what are the most important things for you to get great at right now? Some of them will come from the institution and some of them will come from you, right? If you tell me that it's really important for you, for you as a person to get better at X, it's hard for me to say, no, I don't want you to focus on that, right? So um, I, think, I think finding that, that short list of, of both institutional and personal priorities um, and really focusing on growth one step at a time, let's get great at those things and let's move on to another thing on the list. That may be the best advice I have right now. I think that sounds like something we've been hearing a lot of, which is what is the next right thing? Right? Yeah. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's an elephant, one bite at a time. Princess uh, Anna, Princess Anna knows everything, the next right thing. <laughs> um, so we have a question here, and I'm gonna tackle a little bit of this from the One Schoolhouse perspective, and then Andy, I'm really interested in yours. So we've got the question asking, do you have any experience having teachers observe one another's LMS pages as a vehicle for observation and feedback? And I think there's kind of two layers with this. One is that as an institution, um, we hope that you've got some templates and some expectations, you know, that each week starts, for example, at one schoolhouse with the video that the teachers made welcoming the students to the week so that students don't use their cognitive skills to figure out, oh, how do I turn in Mr. Gao's homework and it's different from how I turn in Ms. Hanawald's and then Mr. Shaw wants this. So there's some streamlined expectations there that are the same for everybody. And that can be just a checklist, right? Before school starts and then maybe a periodic, you know, you can set up that up within a department or within a team. Let's just make sure that we're all meeting those particular standards. And then there's that deeper question of, if, if your mission and your values and your goals this year are maybe peer interaction, have you set up discussion boards that foster the kind of peer interaction that you've defined for each other? And knowing who can help, right? If you're doing peer-to-peer -peer communication or shared editing of documents, you know, are you using the same tools as your colleagues in another department so that kids can carry the skills they're learning from course to course? So Andy, that's kind of a long preamble and I'm sorry, we're, we're gonna to start to run out of time. So um, any last questions, please put them in, but I'll give you a minute to answer that one too. Sure, I mean, you, you said it better than I could. I, I think what comes up for me is, 
everything a teacher does is both observable and important. I remember uh, early in my career, I was having students do kind of uh, collaborative exploration activities in my classroom and, and, and I was floating around facilitating and uh, my supervisor came in and said, I'll come back when you're teaching. Um, I think that, uh, so whether it's about what happens in the classroom or the LMS or student work, it's all observable, it's all important. And for me, the most important thing is to pin down what exactly are we looking for at the school in, in the venue of, uh, of teaching. So I had that experience as well. And one of the things that I've always maintained is that students, if students are actively engaged in learning and getting feedback, and that experience was designed by a teacher, that is in fact teaching. Yeah. Bingo. <laughs> Um, and on that note, I'm going to say thank you so much for joining us here. If you're interested in learning more, um, we do have a whole course that's one week about observation and feedback. It's different this year. So that's on the One Schoolhouse website. And we thank you all for coming. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, everybody.